Uh, hello, Elm Europe. This is uh, rendering text with WebGL. Uh, so I've been using Elm mostly for games and some graphic demos. Um, and, and for me, Elm is a frictionless tool to dive into a, a different domain and learn it. So this time, we are going to dive into the domain of text rendering. Uh, but first, let me introduce you to Nadia, who is also here with me. Uh, Nadia is studying interface design, and she designs typefaces. Uh, so for her, this work is uh, some sort of foundation to be able to run different uh, typographic experiments. And I'm going to use two fonts that she designed uh, in my slides. Uh, so, uh, what's here for all of us? All of us here are uh, front-end developers. We are building UI in the browser. And what is UI? Uh, it's basically text. And browsers are pretty powerful tools for controlling typography on the screen. Just take a look at all the CSS properties uh, that somehow, in some way, affect how text looks on the screen. And yet, we may take all of this for granted. Uh, but you might think that it is a solved problem. Uh, but when you look closer, you actually realize that there's a lot of solved problems. Uh, I hope that uh, after, the, uh, after you see this talk, uh, you will not only learn something about what it takes to render a font, but also uh, start appreciating web as a platform a little bit more uh, than before. Uh, so let's for a moment pretend that we don't have uh, browser support for text. Uh, then what would we do? Of course, we would write some code. Uh, and it will probably be a code that addresses uh, a certain use case. And this is what uh, we also faced. Uh, we had a use case to render some text in a game, uh, a game that had to fit 64 by 64 pixels uh, that was imposed by uh, the rules of the game jam. Uh, so uh, please meet the first uh, typeface called Mojifont, after, uh, named after the game it was built for. And Mojifont is a typeface that is actually distributed as an Elm package. Uh, so, uh, what you get is a function that knows how to print the text, and you can parameterize it by a function that knows how to uh, print a glyph from that text. And it also exports a sprite sheet as a base64 uh, data URI encoded uh, image. So, how can we use this uh, to render text in WebGL? Uh, in order to render it in WebGL, all we have to do is implement this uh, function that knows how to print a letter. And uh, here you can see the information that this function gets. is basically where is this letter in the text, and also it provides coordinates where it is uh, on the sprite sheet and uh, its dimensions. So in order to render it with WebGL, we have to uh, implement a function that returns two triangles uh, that cover the glyph. And we attach uh, certain information to the corners of these triangles, uh, also called vertices in WebGL terms. Uh, so, that when, uh, so the information that we attach is basically its coordinates, and also its coordinates uh, on the sprite sheet. So when uh, WebGL is rendering pixels of those triangles, uh, it can do a lookup on the sprite sheet and then uh, render this pixel on the screen. It's also possible to render this font in 3D. Uh, and it's done in a very similar way, uh, but instead of returning two triangles, uh, you return many triangles that define cubes for each pixel of the glyph. And then you also tag each corner of, of those triangles uh, with an information about where each pixel is located on the sprite sheet. So when WebGL is processing these vertices, uh, it can do a similar lookup on the texture and then decide which uh, cubes have to be pushed away. By the way, this is interactive. Okay. <laughs> 
uh, moving on. Uh, this was a very simple and naive implementation. It addressed our use case, uh, but obviously it uh, won't scale in the real world scenario where uh, type designers are working with professional software and we have well established font formats. In this case, uh, we have to consume this data format that is defined. And this is the next part of my talk. Uh, so meet another typeface uh, called Iverny uh, that is Nadia is working on, and this is a real the real typeface. It is saved in the open type format. It is a currently popular format that is standardized by Microsoft and Adobe. Uh, so how do we render it? Uh, because there is no binary support in Elm. I had to rely on OpenType.js as a parser for this format to prepare a JSON format that can be consumed from Elm. So then I decoded into Elm, and then the most of work was focused on how to render it with uh, WebGL. So in order to render it with WebGL, we first need to understand uh, the metrics of the glyph of uh, each uh, letter from the font. And I made this uh, visualization that takes the real data from the font file and presents uh, a letter. A letter uh, has its own coordinate system with uh, y-axis pointing up, and uh, x-axis is the baseline. So a letter uh, rests on the baseline. Uh, the most important thing is uh, advanced width. It's, uh, the width of the letter is basically telling uh, how, th how we should move from uh, rendering one letter onto rendering another letter uh, when we render text. Uh, left bearing is the distance from the y-axis to the leftmost uh, coordinate of the glyph. And it's uh, so also totally fine for it uh, to be negative, as you can see for the letter J. And units per m defines the scale. Uh, so uh, the scale of the coordinate system is uh, in units. And when we want to render font on the screen, we specify font size. So when you say, I want to draw a font with uh, font size set to 24 pixels, what you actually mean is that this 24 pixels will have to be converted to 1,000 units. And M itself uh, comes from the metal type. Uh, so here you can see my uh, letterpress work, uh, work from the letterpress uh, workshop at Miat Museum in Ghent. I flipped the image so you could read a joke about semicolon. Uh, so, uh, Actually, M in metal type is the height of the metal body from which uh, uh, the, each letter rises. And normally in metal type, uh, letters uh, are not uh, going outside the uh, metal body, which is not uh, the case for digital fonts. And this is an illustration of a uh, a glyph from the digital type rendered as if it was metal type. And you can also play with it. So it's, you see letter G. And if we use letter J, then we can actually see that the leg of this letter is going outside. And also, if we render a star, uh, we see that it goes past M. So we can see it's there on top. Uh, so you may wonder how to do this sort of thing in Elm. Uh, OpenTypeJS does a lot of things for us. When we get an information about the glyph, uh, we have it as an SVG path. Uh, so an SVG path specification is a list of SVG, is a list of commands uh, that control the pen. So one of such commands is move move two coordinates then, or draw a line to coordinates, or draw a Bezier curve. And 
and here you can see the dot, the black dots are dots on the curves and red dots are control points for Bezier curves. So the first thing we do, we of course have to parse SVG and it's uh, pretty simple to do it with Elm parser. Uh, so now we have our union type that defines all the path commands. And the next thing we do is we have to convert uh, curves to line segments. And thanks for uh, wonderful library Elm geometry, we are able to do it also pretty straightforward. Uh, thanks, Ian, for working on this. <laughs> Uh, then we have to find outlines and holes, and for this we have to check the winding of the curves. So all the, uh, all the counterclockwise curves are outlines and clockwise curves are holes, uh, at least in our font. And then, uh, again, using Elm geometry, uh, we triangulate um, and we get a bunch of triangles that we can easily render with WebGL. So that's about rendering glyph. Uh, moving on, uh, in order to render text, uh, we have to be aware of an additional information that is there in open type format, uh, uh, mainly called open type features. Open type features are two tables that are in the font. Uh, that let us control uh, some modifications of how the text rendering should work. And one such table is a substitution table, and it lets us substitute the glyphs if this feature is enabled. Uh, there are many different types of substitutions, and the amount of information stored as this table and all different types of information is enormous. Uh, so what I did, I, I cheated and I used, uh, again, OpenType.js uh, has pre-processed an information about the ligatures. And ligatures is a substitution that replaces uh, many glyphs with a single glyph. Um, another feature is uh, positioning feature. It lets uh, control the position of the letters in the text. And in this case, I implemented uh, kerning. Kerning is uh, a way to compensate the white space so that uh, text looks nice without gaps. Uh, and kerning is a certain case of pair adjustment. So it lets control spacing between pairs of glyphs. And it's usually a negative offset that is applied to advanced width. So as you remember from the glyph metric advanced width is the distance from the origin of uh, the first glyph to the origin of the second glyph. So knowing about that, uh, moving on, uh, when we want to render text, we usually want to render a paragraph of text. And in order to, to render a paragraph of text, uh, we have to be aware of line breaking because we want to fit the text uh, into available display space. Uh, or, or should I rather set, say uh, word trapping? Word trapping is a special case of line breaking uh, that breaks lines uh, between words and not inside words. So the uh, result API of the text function looks a little bit different uh, from, uh, from the previous case. Uh, here, we also have to parameterize it with a function that knows how to uh, evaluate a glyph. And in this case, it's the function that basically generates a mesh, a WebGL mesh that is created out of those triangles. And then we pass it a style. And uh, speaking about the style, uh, it supports uh, basically font, font size, line height, line width, and a list of uh, typographic features. So it's currently kerning or ligatures. And what it returns is a tuple, and the first in this tuple is a list of evaluated glyphs uh, enhanced with uh, some information about where each glyph uh, is located uh, in text and its scale. 
And it also gives us back style. And the reason why we pass around style is because we want to cache the glyphs that have been already evaluated so that we don't have to run those heavy computations every time we encounter the same glyph. So when you want to reuse this style, then you, can, you have to pass it around. And uh, Elm is uh, very explicit about side effects. So uh, let's take a look closer at how this algorithm works. Uh, it's a recursive algorithm. And in the state of the recursion, uh, we keep uh, just like enough information for it in order to tell how to render the next glyph. So it keeps a line width, a current pen position, all the next glyphs, all the uh, rendered glyphs, and glyphs uh, from the last uh, word. So when we take a new uh, glyph and it is a, a visible character, then we just print it if, it if it fits on the line. And if we take a space, then uh, we erase the previous word because it fits on the line. And when the next glyph is going outside the line width, uh, then what we do is we move pen onto the next line, and we take the letters from the current uh, incomplete word, and we put them back. So they will be rendered uh, from the beginning of the next line. And we repeat this process until the, all the next glyphs are rendered. Uh, so, uh, so here you, can, you saw that we went from a very naive approach of rendering text as code and to a less naive implementation of rendering real fonts. Uh, so one learning from this is that Elm is a very great research tool. Uh, it is very powerful, and the compiler takes, saves you a lot of time, a time you can spend on, and on focusing to explore new domains. In this case, uh, I had to learn about the structure of the font format and what has to be done, what are the uh, data dependencies between uh, different steps of the font rendering pipeline. You also saw that what we implemented is only a fraction of the, what the real font engine should do. Uh, so text is a super complex, uh, text rendering is a super complex domain. And I hope that like, we can come back to our things that we are doing with CSS and just be aware of what is kind of happening uh, behind the curtains. And even though uh, we, our approach uh, was very simple and trivial, uh, having an access to our own text renderer uh, allows us to run our own typographic experiments and uh, fiddle with under underlining uh, code. Uh, so something like this. Uh, I, will, I will open source the slides. Uh, they are all written in Elm, and the text rendering code is a part of them. Uh, please let me know if you find the text renderer useful so, so it can be made into an Elm package. And uh, feel free to chat to me or Nadia about typography. And I'm also happy to talk about WebGL in Elm. Thank you. Yeah. Has anybody questions? Andrea, is that effect that you're putting up there done with the technology you just described? Ah. Andrea, is that effect that we see up there done with the technology that you described? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful font. Does the open sourcing of the slides mean that you open source the font too, or that we at, we at least get to use it? Uh, it's, I think it's not a question to me, but more to Nadia. Uh, but uh, it's still, 
it, she's still working on this font, so it's not finished, and it's probably we will consider this at the, at the late, latest uh, stage. It's nice. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, yeah. Um, I noticed that uh, you were uh, triangulating, uh, like uh, each um, each uh, letter, each type was divided in several triangles. Um, are there any considerations about performance with with this? Uh, so I had performance considerations, and that's why I store evaluated glyphs in a dictionary. So when you're rendering again, they are just found in the dictionary. So when the same letter is used multiple times, it's not evaluated again. Anybody else? Uh, Andre, I've seen an amazing tool uh, from you that kind of showed the concept of uh, dynamic fonts, where you can uh, where you can control like the width and and uh, like the geometry of a font in a much more granular le level than just I don't know bold light see my bold. Is that something you made with the same technology, and is that something you can show us a little glimpse of as well? Uh, I can show it. If if I have Wi-Fi, uh, so so basically what it is, it's visualizing uh, variable fonts. It, variable fonts are fonts that have multiple axes that you can control, and it, so you, you you can basically you load the font and then you can move the sliders uh, to look at bolder, to make it look bolder or wider. Uh, it's also a part of OpenType, uh, so I think that companies are lobbying this format to make it more efficient uh, on web, to make the size smaller. Uh, and this is uh, not using uh, my renderer, because in order to implement uh, all the deltas and sliders, it would have it's it's super complicated, but it's using Elm geometry, and and this uh, this like thing in 3D is uh, wait is uh, is rendered with SVG. Um, if you had to guess, or could you give an estimate of how much code you had to write for this pre presentation, uh, excluding like all the? Yeah, I assume this uh, reuses some of your libraries and stuff, but just to get like a uh, estimate. I haven't measured, but you can do it when I open source the slides. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, have you considered using SVG to render the triangles instead of WebGL? Or? Uh, so some of my slides are rendered with SVGs. Uh, this is SVG. Okay. Uh, this is WebGL. This is WebGL. This is WebGL. Uh, so it's actually it's pretty easy when uh, you get SVG path. You just set it on uh, to a D attribute of of, uh, of the path element. Uh, the letter will be upside down, so you'll have to uh, sc scale it with negative y. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question for you. So, if you are able to to write your text yourself, then you are able also to to know how much size it will take to render, so you can also um, uh, know exactly how much um, place it will take uh, in a, a wall viewport, for example. So have you thought about some ways to 
use that in order to make um, the scrollable experience um, more uh, more something that is manageable by ourselves instead of relying on the browser. It's an interesting question. I think that, uh, like, in order for it, if, in order for us to be able to use this, in order to measure the font, how, um, in order to use it in the browser, it has to be compatible with with what the browser does. So, I think it it is the case when you want to render just one line, uh, when you want to render a paragraph, then it will we'll be different. Okay, because because when when we are rendering some some something with Elm, what I mean is that sometimes you are uh, you are putting a text uh, inside the, a div, for example, but you never really know how how much space it takes in in a height. You have to calculate it. So knowing how much space it will take could be could be easier, but like it, it's not it's it's okay. <laughs> I'm doing a statement, so yeah. Uh, okay, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, once you uh, once we implemented uh, line breaking, have you looked at the text justification algorithm? Uh, say it again. Text justification to uh, have um, uh, I just didn't, justified text. I, I didn't do it here, uh, but like if. In a very simple way, uh, what I have, how I had to, would have to modify my algorithm. I would have to store lines that I completed, and then just like distribute the space within lines. Although it would not be an ideal way of doing it, I guess. But uh, this could work. So, one last question, if anybody has. No. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much, Andre.